Well, good morning, New Beginnings. <laughs> yeah. How many of you just right now, just taking just an impromptu poll, how many of you are typically inside service people? Can I hear your, your honk? You all just made a big, big mistake. I love each and every one of you, but you just made a big mistake. You just told me by your honking, there's an amen in you. And so scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And so I'm expecting when we go back inside. How many of you know we're going to eventually go back inside? Amen. I'm expecting you to translate those honks into amens. Okay. Not a honk on that one. Okay. <laughs> Again, it's so good to see you. Indeed, this is a proud daddy uh, day for me. I'm so proud of my children. And uh, uh, I remember Michelle telling me stories of her being a little girl singing on this boat. And, uh, and, and a younger version of me, much younger version of me, once preached on this boat during my internship back in 1995. And, uh, and, you know, it just kind of got to me. Uh, kind of a, a chord of sentimentality just kind of got plucked. Uh, when I was standing off to the side, now I see next generation uh, standing here and giving praise to our Father, and uh, it was a great, great moment, and uh, I'm just so proud of all of my kids, and, uh, and, and so thanks for letting me just get a little verklempt uh, during that moment because it was just uh, very, very special. Today I've got a very special message that I want to share with you. Uh, this information I got this week I thought was pretty interesting. This week I read about a 76-year-old Londoner by the name of Bill Baker. Bill Baker recently wed a woman named Edna Harvey. Edna happens to be Bill's granddaughter's husband's mother. You got that? She is Bill's granddaughter's husband's mother. That's where the confusion began, according to Baker's granddaughter, Lynn. She says, my mother-in-law is now my step-grandmother. My grandfather is now my stepfather-in-law. My mom is my sister-in-law. And my brother is my nephew. But even crazier than that is now I'm married to my uncle and my own children are my cousins. How many of you would say, ooh? <laughs> you know, sometimes relationships can get a little bit confusing. Michelle's brother, Tommy, is married to my younger sister, Julie. And then, of course, they always like to remind us that they got married first, and, uh, and then we married after them, of course. And so sometimes it gets a little bit confusing, all the intermarrying and all the relationships. One thing I do know, though I've been here less than a year, is that most of you, if not half of you, are somehow mysteriously related to Christian Beasley. That's all I know. And uh, it's a, some of you admitted to that. That's a, that's a good thing. Uh, but that's really, really cool. Yeah, relationships can get really, really confusing. Or sometimes relationships can appear confusing. This seems to be our family portrait. If you know anything about our family or you've seen our family portrait, you see that there's a lot of different flavors, uh, a lot of different hues and colors in and, and, and our family portrait. And God is an amazing artist. And when he built our family, he really put in a whole lot of different things. And, and it's fun and it's interesting when we go to public places and we look forward to going back to some public places soon, is when we travel together all together as a family, how people just kind of watch us and, uh, and they try to figure us out. Uh, when Michelle was, uh, when we were, our kids were much, much younger and all the different uh, 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 characters in our family, people used to think that she was a daycare when she went to different places and they're trying to figure it out. You know, sometimes relationships can be confusing. Sometimes they can appear to be confusing. 2,000 years ago, God sent his son Jesus to the earth to ultimately die in our place. Why? To invite us into a relationship. Not a weird relationship, not a confusing relationship, but instead a beautiful relationship, a fulfilling relationship. Now and after this earthly life ends. It's a relationship that's characterized by a few important things. Unconditional love and limitless grace. But we know it's a paternal relationship. It is a father-child relationship. Recently, I read where astronomers tell us that 
traveling to the nearest galaxy would take you 749 million years. How many of you would say, that's a long time? <laughs> and that traveling to the end of this known universe would take 225 trillion years. Boy, that's a long time. But here's the amazing thing. To come into the presence of the creator of it all, all a child of God needs to do is cry out, Abba, Father. How amazing the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. It's a scandalous relational invitation that God is offering every man, woman, and child in Tampa, Florida today. You know, throughout Scripture, this union is mentioned in several different ways. I just mentioned the beautiful illustration of a father-child relationship. But you know, throughout Scripture, we also read some other relational analogies of a husband and a wife relationship. And, and some of you can relate to that and, and the beauty of that and the intimacy of that relationship. We read in the 66 books of the Bible, we read of a, a shepherd and a sheep relationship. And, and if you come from an agrarian society or if you've traveled to one, you know that that's a special and an intimate relationship of leading and following and, and caregiving. We also read in Scripture of a relationship between the vine and the branches. And I'm looking forward to sharing a message with you very soon inside that I had prepared for you for our last inside service, but we moved out here. And so we see these different kind of symbiotic relationships that happen throughout the scope of Scripture. But there's one relational image that I think sometimes gets overlooked. And that relationship that is clearly outlined in the Bible is the potter in the clay. The potter in the clay. Now, sometimes when I think about the potter in the clay, I think, you know what, that sounds a little impersonal, doesn't it? See, I can relate to a, a father-child relationship. I was blessed with, a, with an amazing father. I, I'm a, surrounded by a, a great stepfather and a great father-in-law. I have these great fatherly relationships, or had those, and, and, and so that does pluck a chord of sentimentality in my in my heart. I think about the husband and wife relationship and, and I get to relate to that in a very special way and the intimacy of that and the relational depth and, and all that goes into that. I think of even the shepherd and the sheep and, and I've had the opportunity to go to Israel now several times and I've seen shepherds and their flocks and I get to see the, the inner relationship and it's very heart moving. But, uh, but Potter... <laughs> And clay, it, again, it just seems really, really impersonal. Many, many years ago, as a, a good boy growing up in the Church of Christ, I used to sing a hymn. We used to all sit together as a family on, uh, back in the day, and, and I'd typically sit next to my maternal grandmother, Maddie Lou Watson, and, and there was a great old hymn of our faith. Many of you have grown up singing it, and you know the words, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, written by Adelaide Potter. Well, you know where it says, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, and I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded, and still. Now, admittedly, again, as a good Church of Christ boy growing up and doing that very, very near here, I, I wasn't sure exactly as a boy what I was singing about. However, as a, as a grown-up, as a voracious student of Scripture, I read in places like Jeremiah 18 and Isaiah chapter 64 and Job chapter 10 about this very special relational image, the potter and the clay. Now, archaeologically speaking, pottery making ranks among the, the oldest of all the crafts. The Babylonians left us the, the earliest artifacts, bricks, drainage pipes, and household shrines. After them, the Egyptians came along, and they discovered the skill of glazing and the utilization of using the potter's wheel. During the Exodus wanderings, we know that the Israelites decided to use a, a lighter vessel, uh, using cords and skins, and, and, and as they came into the Promised Land, they reverted back to pottery making. Today, much of the pottery there in Israel in the ruins of the potter's shops can be, can be found. We have visited those and we have seen those. By the way, just giving you a quick update, 24 of you have already signed up for our Israel trip in March. By the way, we're still a go for that trip. 
nothing has changed. And so we're inviting you. That's half of the bus is filled already. And we're hoping that maybe some of you or maybe some of you watching online will join us. And if you need more information about that, we'd love to tell you about that. But half of the bus is filled. And when you go over to Israel, the Holy Land, you see some of the ruins of these potters' homes, which, by the way, were also their shops. And, of course, there's a lot of pottery that has survived over the years. Now, we know in practice, and we know in practicality, that the potter is simply someone who made and somebody who decorated pottery. That's what they did. That was their vocation in life. His purpose was to take raw clay and produce usable vessels from them. Vessels that would reap a profit. Vessels that would be useful and handy. And ultimately, vessels that would bring him honor. Now, after this potter would travel a good distance from his home or his shop, he would cultivate that raw clay from a clay field, and then he would take that clay home, and then he would form that formless lump on his potter's wheel. Now, the wheel we know was consisted of two wheels, actually, an upper wheel and a lower wheel. The, the upper wheel, or the top wheel, was the horizontal surface that was used for the actual shaping or the molding of the clay. The lower wheel was spun by his feet. And so, as he turned the wheel with his feet, he would put the lump on the top wheel, and then he would apply water to it to make it as malleable as possible. And those of you who've done pottery before, you've seen somebody who's done pottery, you know that there's the utilization and the skill of the potter to make and use with their hands and with their palms what they would do is he would apply just the right amount of pressure to meet his design. In order for the design to have the, the right design, it had to stay right in the center of the potter's wheel. Now, if somehow, if it somehow moved off of the wheel, or he found that it was becoming something that he did not have a vision for or a design for, it became asymmetrical, or maybe some foreign matter somehow got in the clay, he would absolutely stop the process. He would ball up the clay, and then he would start over again. Tenacious, persistent in making that clay into what he had envisioned it and designed it in his mind to be. Now here's something important I want you to catch today, especially if you're taking notes. The potter's hand never left the clay. The potter's hand never left the clay. As the potter is spinning the wheel, if his hand leaves the clay, what's going to happen? It's going to fly off the wheel. It's going to be damaged. It's going to collect foreign matter. And so it was imperative that the potter's hand stayed on the wheel. Take a note of that. The next step and the last few steps would be the drying and the firing. See, you couldn't just leave it there in that wet, malleable form. It had to become solid. It had to dry in order to be useful, in order for it to contain things, especially fluids. And so therefore then at that point, the clay had to go through a drying or a firing process. Typically the furnaces reached up from 500 to 900 degrees. That's hot. And then we know that the final step in this whole pottery making process was the decorating and the actual using. Some of you are saying, Steve, we got up early this morning. <laughs> Steve, maybe you haven't read the headline. Steve, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Thanks a million for the history lesson on ancient pottery making. But what in the world does that have to do with me? And I would respond emphatically, absolutely everything. Absolutely everything, absolutely everything right now in the middle of the COVID-19 outbreak. It means everything. Here's what I want you to catch today, taking notes, is that God is the potter. God is the potter. How do I know that? Because from Genesis chapter 1, God has been molding formlessness into design. Scripture tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was, what? Formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The earth was formless. And on molding day number six, 
We read as Bible students in Genesis chapter 2 that the Lord God formed the man, what from what? The dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living, breathing being. See, from the beginning of time, or at least human time, God the Father has had a vision. God the Father has had an ideal for man and his relationship with man. That he would form him of all the things that God created, that he would create him in his own image. Genesis 1 and verse 27. That he would have a special relationship. Not that God doesn't have a special relationship with all the creatures that he has created, but that he would have a special relationship relationship with the one creature in which he himself would breathe life into them that his breath his ruha the hebrew word there would be absolutely uh in, in proximity to this creature that he created that somehow this creature of all the creatures that he created that he would share certain attributes with god that none other of his creation shared and that he would have an intimate relationship with this creature. That when he walked with this creature, and he spoke to this creature, and he interacted with this creature, that he would see himself in this creature. That this creature would have a, 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 the ability to reflect God's own glory back to him. A special relationship. Again, like no other. But then also being Bible students, and I know many, and to most of you are, then Genesis 3 happened, and the vessel was broken. Scripture says that God had a special relationship with Adam and Eve. They walked together in the coolness of the day. They had an intimacy back before the sin, back before the fall. We know that there was no sin, there was no guilt, there was no shame. That there was no shame between the man and his woman. There was no shame between them and God. There was no hiding that took place up until that time. And then sin came in and it shattered everything. And suddenly this relationship that was to be intimate and pure, now it was broken. The pottery was shattered all over the place. But friends, let me remind you that hell forgot something. That a father's love never gives up. A father's love, it never gives up. And God sent his son to the place that was filled with these broken vessels. And through a bloody cross, he traded his perfection for our brokenness. King David says it this way. I think it's the most beautiful thing. And he sang this in Psalm 40. He says this, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord. I turned to, he turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. And He set my feet on a rock. And He gave me a firm place to stand. And He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And then David concludes, many will see and many will fear and many will put their trust in the Lord. David said, man, all I brought to the table was brokenness. I was a broken pot. I was a broken vessel. I gave God nothing. All I really gave to the situation was a cry. And yet God in His grace and His mercy turned to me. And in that place, that muddy place, He took me, He extracted me. And with passion, He lifted me. And He put my feet, not in another muddy place, but He put my feet and planted me solidly on a rock. And He put a new song in my mouth. And now I sing a different song. I believe I'm looking at a bunch of people today and you're singing a different song today than the song you used to sing. That your life has purpose. Your life now has joy. You have found what life is really all about. And as Christian said, it's not about materialism. And it's not about money. But it's about becoming more and more like Christ. To know Him. To be more like Him. And to make Him known. David said, man, I used to be in the pit. And I believe I'm looking at a bunch of windshields right now. And behind those windshields are a bunch of people that know what it's like to at one time in your life to live in the pit. I know what it's like to be there. I know what it's like. Believe me, there was times in many, many Sundays where I didn't come to nice churches like this. But that was the day to sleep in after having a really, really fun night. Or so I thought it was. 
And yet I lived in guilt. I lived in shame. And yet God still, to this day, God is still turning brokenness into beauty. And He'll do that with your life today. And He'll do that with the lives of your children. I know that we've been praying for some of you today. And, and I know that you've been giving us some prayer requests about your children. You've got some prodigals. We can relate to that. We understand that in the keeper home. And all we know is that we have a God. We have a potter. We have a potter who loves us so much that he left his place and he went to the clay field far away. And that this God can take raw things. God can take the most rebellious of things. God can take formless things and he can bring them to his house and he can build them and he can form them and he can mold them into vessels of glory, noble vessels that he can use. And so today, if you're feeling despair about maybe somebody you know, maybe a child, maybe a dear friend who's living far from God, Get a vision of what the potter can do. Get your eyes off of the situation and get your eyes on God and get your faith in gear and recognize that God is still a potter. Here's the second thing I want you to catch today is that you are the clay. God is the Father and you are the clay. You see, the creation account reminds us that we were all formed from the earth. In other words, you can't recreate yourself. For instance, clay left alone cannot become a bowl. It cannot become a pitcher or a vase or a, a teacup or anything decorative in your home. See, there has to be a, a process. There has to be a, a place where the potter intervenes and he comes in. See, left by ourselves, we cannot become beautiful. Left by ourselves, we cannot become useful. Now, at that point, maybe one of you are saying, hey, Steve, do, do I play a part in the process at all? Sounds like clay is pretty inert, it's pretty neutral, it, it, it can't form itself. Do, do I get to play a part? And I would answer that, absolutely. See, here's the part that, that we can play. The kind of vessel you become is up to you. The kind of vessel you become is absolutely up to you. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2, 20-21 that you have a choice today, friends. You can either be a vessel of honor, a noble vessel, or you can be a vessel of dishonor. Now, the fact that you're here on a Sunday morning when you could be in so many other places, well, at least back home, <laughs> it, it tells me that you want to live a life of, of nobility to God, that you want to live a life that brings Him glory. You want to be a vessel of honor. And so how do we do that? Let me share with you three ways. Three ways that you can be a vessel of honor for His glory while you're here, this side of glory. The first is this, is daily yielding. Daily yielding. Or a word that we don't like very much, and that is surrendering. See, our life is a life of surrendering. And not just once, not in a conversion experience, but every day that we surrender to the potter. See, clay, if it just kind of was rebellious every day, if it was mutinous, if it thought that somehow it was greater than the potter, it would never become what God intended for it to be. But you see, it submits in a way, doesn't it? It surrenders to the hand of the potter. And this is the same that we would say, this is what requires trust. Trusting the potter. Trusting God. Hey, God knows what He's doing. God has a vision for your life. God is working a plan in your life. You can trust God completely. Why? Because His hand is always on you. Friends, you're never going to become a vessel of honor, a vessel God can use, a decorated vessel that God brings God glory until you decide every single day I'm going to yield to God. Not just Sunday from 8.30 to 9.30, but every single day I am making the conscious, intentional decision. I am the clay you're the potter, mold me today, I'm surrendering to your will. It requires daily yielding. But secondly, and so imperative, it requires staying centered on the wheel. It requires staying centered on the wheel. What does that mean? That you and I need to be in the middle of His Word. There is somehow a, a, a connection here with His Word that is imperative to becoming what the potter God wants us to become. And yet, so many of us are not in the Word of God. We use it as a glorified coaster, or it sits in the back of our car until the next Sunday service. 
Friends, I want you to know that the Word of God is daily manna. It's not cake. It's not bread for special occasions. Instead, the Word of God is, is intentionally, it is our spiritual nutrition. And you're never going to become the vessel that the potter wants to create apart from your time intentionally spent in His Word. But not only does it mean staying centered in the middle of His Word, but also in the middle of His will. Are you living in the will of God today? Does your lifestyle represent that you're in the middle of the will of God? Are you living in a way, in a fashion, in a way that God would have you to live in the real world? I think during a pandemic, I think that is when that's really, really tested. And so, if we're going to become vessels of honor, vessels of glory, vessels He can use, it requires a, a daily yielding, a daily surrendering to Him. It requires staying centered on the potter's wheel. But thirdly, it requires being patient. Being patient. How many real people came to church today? <laughs> friends, a pandemic, the guidelines that come with that, friends, as weeks go on and on, let's just be honest, let's just be real, patience is running thin. But let me remind you of a few important things. First of all, is that God is always teaching us. God is always teaching us. Some of you have shared with me already in these past few weeks what God is teaching you, or perhaps maybe what God is reminding you during this time. He's reminding you that little things matter. He's reminding you of things that you've begun to overlook. He's reminding you, and He's reminding me of misprioritizations. And God is teaching us that God never wastes our experiences. This is not a wasted season in your life. This is not a wasted season in Tampa. This is not a wasted season around the world that God is always teaching us that God wants to use this season in a very, very important way. But here's the part a lot of people don't want to hear is that you can't skip the furnace. <laughs> you can't skip the furnace. Many of us do our best to avoid the furnace. We don't want to get, when things get too hot in the kitchen, man, we just want to take off. When things get too painful, when suffering reaches a certain height, when there's too much discomfort that somehow comes in one way or another, man, check please, I'm out of here. We don't want to suffer. And yet it is important, it is vital to that vessel becoming what God wants it to become, for it eventually to be beautiful, and most importantly, to be honorable and to be useful that you have to go through the fire. You have to go through the furnace. As I look across, I see some faces I recognize many. Some I can't identify who you are. Maybe I know which vehicle that you're in. And Man, I want you to know, we know about many of the prayer requests that you submit. This staff, this leadership, we pray every single week intentionally. We know that you're going through the furnace. You're going through some tough stuff. And you have no idea how long you're going to be in the fire. But all I can tell you is that God is the one who is faithful to stand with us in the fire. And that the fire is essential in order for you to become who God wants you to be. That somehow He's using this unique season as a part of your molding. That somehow this unprecedented time of the world is a paramount to the vessel He wants you to become. And so as your brother, as your shepherd... Let me encourage you to continue to be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Even when you're in the fire, be patient. The fire is absolutely necessary. Friends, in conclusion, God is the potter. You are the clay. And life is the potter's wheel. And only by yielding to the potter every single day can you become who you were meant to be his better vision for your life. It's only through surrendering every day to the potter's vision for your life can you become and I become honorable and noble vessels that bring him glory. Paul wrote in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that his all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Friends, I mentioned that the last step is the decoration, isn't it? And today I want you to know that the ultimate decoration for your life and the ultimate decoration in my life 
is that you and I, we get to carry Jesus. We get to carry Jesus. See, it's not about the shell. It's not about the container. It's about what's in the container. Yesterday, we had a, a nice little graduation party at a, at a friend's house in Zephyr Hills for, for Emma. And I don't know how much Emma knew was coming our way, but we decided we're going to make it really, really special. And, and we all put on our, our William Jessup University t-shirts and and we stopped at the store, and Michelle got a bunch of decorations. And, and so when we went to where Emma was, we put all these things up for her. And, and then at the end of the day, she opened up to a few gifts. And, and she opened this gift, and once and, and she saw, man, the, it, it was about what was inside the box. And, and, and it wasn't the box itself. Matter of fact, I, I doubt if she even has the box now. It was something special that was in the box, something that she had been wanting, something that was special, something that showed that we honored her and we respected her and congratulated her on a great achievement. But you see, it's not about the box. It's not about the container. It's not about the vessel, but it's about what's inside the vessel. It's what's inside. And friends, I want you to know that inside we get to carry Jesus. It's not about the clay, it's not about the container, it's not about the packaging, but ultimately it's about the privilege that you and I have, and that is to carry Jesus Christ by His Spirit. We get to take His Word, we get to take His message. We get to, we don't have to, we get to. And when we take Jesus Christ, especially during a time when many people are so tired and and feeling the hopelessness and feeling so restricted and so minimized in a pandemic season, guess what? We get to take, get to take the Lord of Lords. We get to take Jesus Christ and the hope that He offers every man, woman, and child. What a beautiful honor that is. And so the question is, what kind of vessel are you going to become? You can never become who the potter intended for you to become all by yourself. You're going to need help with that. It's essential that the potter be involved in your life. And here's the good news is that His hands are always on you. They never leave you. Even in those times where you think, man, I think God has left the room. I th- cannot find God. I'm not, I think my prayers are just bouncing off the season, a ceiling. I want to remind you today that the potter's hands are always on the clay. As you persist and as you persevere through this season, be reminded, be of good cheer, that the one who overcame the world His hands are on you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are a potter. Father, we recognize that we could never become who You intend us to be apart from You, apart from a daily surrender. That, Father, that as You have us on the potter's wheel, Father, sometimes that that wheel seems like it's never going to stop spinning. Life can get dizzy, Life can get disorienting. And yet, Father, we trust You. We know that you're, You know what You're doing. And Father, we just ask in the name of Jesus that God, You'd give us the patience to just trust You more and more and more. Father, we recognize that, that Lord, we are in the process of becoming. And Father, I pray for each and every one of us here today on this field or watching online that that we would patiently surrender, we would yield every single day to Your touch, and that, Father, we would see more and more, we would perceive that we're becoming more and more like You. Father, thank You. Forgive us for the times we make it about the container, and we don't make it about the treasure that's inside. Thank You, Father. We love You this day. You're the potter. We're the clay. In Jesus' name we pray.